Uh, so thank you, Dr. Wan, for uh, chairing this session. Big thank you to Drs. Coleman and Leonard for the invitation to be at this uh, terrific meeting. It'll be my pleasure to talk about novel agents in follicular lymphoma. Today, I'm going to focus in my 20 minutes on those agents that we have readily available at our fingertips right now uh, in the clinic and data surrounding those. I'll give just a hint at the end about those agents that are more investigational and clinical trials, but thankfully, I'll have another uh, shot at the microphone and review some more of those newer agents in the setting of our upcoming debate. So to start off, to think about the novel agents, it's helpful, I think, to put them in a broad uh, rubric because there are so many different new agents coming down the pike uh, and uh, in our clinic already. And in my mind, I would group them into three very general categories. One category, as you can see, is the, are those targeting the self surface. And obviously, rituximab really uh, opened that entire era, uh, and that era continues with novel agents directed specifically at the cell surface. The next, I would say, was really directed at intracellular signaling, those pathways that go into the cell and drive the internal biology uh, and um, constitute a large proportion of agents currently in development. And then the last group that I'm going to talk about and think about with you are those affecting the immune microenvironment, uh, as denoted by that uh, big T cell right there. So to focus on targeting the cell surface, and of course this really heralded in uh, the, uh, the era of targeted therapy uh, with the advent of rituximab. We do have a next generation anti-CD20 antibody approved now in abinutuzumab. You're aware that abinutuzumab is approved in combination with, with chlorambucil for CLL in older adults. It is also more recently uh, granted a label in the management of rituximab refractory follicular lymphoma, and we'll go through that data. Abinutuzumab is a bit different than rituximab. Uh, it is a type 2 as opposed to a type 1 monoclonal antibody. It seems to induce uh, more potent direct cell killing, uh, as well as engineered to have uh, increased affinity and more potent ADCC. This was evaluated in a phase 1 trial as a single agent abinutuzumab monotherapy in relapse follicular lymphoma and demonstrated modest activity. I'll focus on the higher dose, only 22 subjects uh, in this phase one study, but the response rate of 60%, uh, CR rate of 23%, and I think, though small numbers, an impressive response rate in rituximab refractory patients of 50%. The median progression-free survival at that uh, full dose in this phase one study uh, was a year, which is fairly favorable in a relapsed refractory population. This was then studied in a head-to-head -head study in rituximab-sensitive relapse follicular lymphoma. This is a phase two study uh, that was randomized in patients who were rituximab-sensitive. They hadn't progressed on or within six months of their prior rituximab. Randomized to rituximab monotherapy or abinutuzumab monotherapy, here called GA-101, for, for, for an induction uh, phase followed by maintenance, rituximab, maintenance rituximab or abinutuzumab, respectively, in those arms. What did this data show? This data is now uh, published in JCO, and you actually can see numerically more favorable response rates um, in favor of abinutuzumab, 64% compared to 49%, CR rate 38% compared to 27%. Uh, despite this, I think disappointingly for this study, uh, shows absolutely no impact whatsoever on progression-free survival. And so I would look at this data and say very clearly, abinutuzumab has no role as a monotherapy in those patients with rituximab-sensitive follicular lymphoma, where rituximab appears to work identically well. What about in combination? That gets us to this Gadolin trial, uh, which is now published more, more very recently in Lancet Oncology. This randomized trial took a high-risk population, and that high-risk population is rituximab refractory follicular lymphoma, and included some other low-grade lymphoma subtypes as well. Refractory defined, again, as progressing on or within six months of rituximab-containing therapy. These patients were randomized to single-agent bendamustine based on single-agent efficacy data uh, uh, and, and, and a label in rituximab refractory disease. And the experimental arm was the combination of abinutuzumab and bendamustine, and that was followed by obinutuzumab maintenance. And so what did this study show? Well, I think the findings are interesting and perhaps a touch complicated to interpret. What it showed there was, first of all, there was absolutely no difference whatsoever in the response rates. The overall response rate and complete response rate was identical between abinutuzumab or tuximab, excuse me, abinutuzumab bendamustine or bendamustine alone. 
There was, however, a difference in terms of progression-free survival that was quite statistically significant and earned this an FDA label. Now, if we look a little bit into the, uh, the curve right here, you'll remember here's the six-month mark where everyone's getting upfront induction therapy with either Benda alone or Benda plus abinutuzumab, and those curves are directly overlapping, and the response rates were identical. They separate only during the maintenance phase after the six-month period, where one group is getting abinutuzumab maintenance and the other is getting no further therapy. I think this raises the prospect of how much uh, uh, truly the abinutuzumab is adding in the induction phase. It doesn't seem that much. It also raises the question of if rituximab maintenance was included, even for rituximab refractory patients, maybe a similar benefit would have been seen because I think rituximab refractoriness is rather fluid and not uh, constant throughout the course of a patient's disease. That said, this is a, a randomized trial which has shown a positive impact in patients with rituximab refractory follicular lymph lymphoma. I will note, of course, that patients in this study did not have prior bendamustine. So a patient who's had, uh, who has rituximab refractory disease and no prior bendamustine, obinutuzumab bendamustine would be a perfectly reasonable approach for those patients. These uh, encouraging results have led to the gallium study. The gallium study is in previously untreated patients using obinutuzumab, and in this study, Patients were randomized to rituximab plus chemotherapy, and here it was dealer's choice of RCHOP, RCVP, or arbendamustine, versus obinutuzumab in combination with those same three chemo backbones. Obinutuzumab chemo versus rituximab chemo, each one followed by maintenance in those respective arms. Now, these data have not been released, but a press release has. And that press release uh, from a few months ago says, quote, results from a pre-plant interim analysis showed that obinutuzumab-based treatment significantly reduced the risk of disease, worsening, or death compared to rituximab-based treatment. So this study has met its primary endpoint. That is all we know. And we eagerly await a presentation of this data to really see the magnitude uh, of that uh, difference uh, when this study is reported. I then want to shift and think about targeting intracellular pathways in follicular lymphoma. And we're going to start with PI3 kinase. And we've heard a lot about PI3 kinase, including at the very scientific level already uh, at this meeting very nicely. We just heard a little bit about uh, peripheral T-cell lymphoma as well. And PI3 kinase is a critical signaling pathway in lymphoma as well as, as other diseases. But uniquely in lymphoma, the delta isoform is expressed predominantly in uh, uh, lymphoid cells. Uh, and so delta-specific PI3 kinase inhibition may avoid some of the toxicities of the pan-PI3 kinase inhibitors that have been studied in solid tumors. So the initial phase one study of idelalisib, a PI3 kinase delta inhibitor, uh, showed very encouraging results. Here in phase one, you can see a 63% response rate and a median uh, progression-free survival of about a year for this novel agent. This prompted, of course, a phase two registration trial that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. This was 125 patients, and what was unique about this registration trial is that these patients were refractory, or excuse me, refractory to both rituximab and alkylating-based therapy. These patients truly represented an unmet medical need. And in these patients, median of four prior therapies, the majority were follicular lymphoma, and what you can see on the top is the vast majority of subjects had a reduction in their tumor volume based on that waterfall plot. The overall response rate uh, uh, was 57 percent. The median progression-free survival, very encouraging at 11 months, reflecting what was seen in phase one. I think it's important with any novel agent to be familiar with the toxicity profile so that toxicity can be monitored for and treated appropriately. And here, toxicities include diarrhea, particularly colitis that can occur relatively late in a patient's course of therapy, a transaminitis or hepatitis, pneumonitis, uh, and infections. But I will say that this drug now has an FDA label and really demonstrates very strong activity in the most um, refractory patients with follicular lymphoma. I'll then turn my attention to the other hot signaling cascade uh, in the setting of lymphoma, and that's, of course, BTK. You've heard elegantly from Dr. Dunleavy about the role of abrutinib in primary CNS lymphoma and in large cell lymphoma. How does it work in the setting of follicular lymphoma? Well, this is phase one data presented by uh, Nate Fowler uh, several years back, and it suggested perhaps a very encouraging response rate uh, with dose escalation. Uh, so this led, of course, to a phase two study. 
That study has been published, and unfortunately, the results were significantly uh, less encouraging than was suggested at phase one with very high dose intensification. Here you can see a response rate of only 28%, uh, with a one-year progression-free survival of uh, 50%. Uh, I will note that on the waterfall plot, a number of patients did have had a reduction in their disease that didn't quite meet criteria uh, for formal response. But right now, I would say this agent as a single agent does not have strong activity in follicular lymphoma. It does not have a role in off-label use in follicular lymphoma right now, in my opinion. But it is an appealing agent for potentially combination therapy moving forward, and a number of combination trials are underway. Let's now think quickly about targeting the microenvironment. Everyone here is familiar with lenalidomide. We've already just heard about lenalidomide. The mechanisms of action of lenalidomide are protein, and they are different across lymphoma subtypes. In follicular lymphoma, very different from large cell lymphoma, which you just heard about from uh, Kieran, uh, we think the mechanism here is most potently by upgrading T cell and NK cell activity and restoring the immune synapse, allowing more direct immune mediated cytotoxicity. And that was work done primarily in the lab of John Gribben. So, this is a uh, randomized phase two study from the CALGB in relapsed follicular lymphoma, initially conceived as a, a three arm trial. It included rituximab monotherapy, um, and that was leading to low accrual. So, that arm was closed, and the two remaining arms were lenalidomide alone or rituximab plus lenalidomide in relapsed follicular lymphoma. Everyone had to have had prior rituximab. And what you can see here, I think, is very encouraging activity from lenalidomide either as a single agent or in combination with rituximab. The overall response rate was 53% alone, 76% when you add rituximab. The CR rate was 20%, and that doubled to close to 40% with lenalidomide plus rituximab. And the uh, time to progression also increased from a median of one year to two years. So a two-year progression-free survival for LEN-R in relapsed follicular lymphoma, I would say, is actually very encouraging um, data. This, I think, is a standard available regimen. I will tell you that lenalidomide and rituximab I use frequently in my practice for patients uh, with uh, relapsed or refractory follicular lymphoma. The excitement about this relapse data has, of course, led to upfront investigation from both uh, a single agent study at the MD Anderson Cancer Center as well as a phase two study within the Alliance Cooperative Group. And what you can see is actually very exciting and very similar data when extended from the single center to the multi-center analysis. In 50 and 65% of patients respectively, a, a remarkable overall response rate of 98% and 96% uh, in those two studies. And I think a, what is most surprising to me is a fairly dramatic complete remission rate. 87% in the MD Anderson study, a very similar 71% in the Alliance study. To remind you, the CR rates from R. CHOP and R. Bendamustine with previously untreated disease rarely break the 50% barrier. So this does compare favorably to traditional chemoimmunotherapy approaches. The progression-free survivals are at limited follow-up but are close to 80% at a couple of years uh, and require uh, maturity uh, for ongoing evaluation. But this is sufficiently exciting phase two data in the upfront setting to lead to a randomized trial, 1,000 patients randomized to rituximab lenalidomide versus the dealer's choice of RCHOP, RCVP, or Arbendamustine. Uh, each one followed by maintenance. This study has completed its accrual, uh, and we await data hopefully within the next couple of years. And this trial, I think, could be the really next randomized trial that could change the standard of care as the initial therapy in follicular lymphoma. And so this data is eagerly anticipated. I'm going to close with a completely uh, um, inscrutable slide for you in your seats uh, with the small font here to demonstrate that the number of novel agents on our horizon is really quite exciting. And I will talk about some of these agents uh, in a few minutes. It includes those targeting the cell surface, particularly antibody drug conjugates shown there. It includes those targeting intracellular pathways and apoptosis, including those targeting PI3 kinase, EZH2, an HDAC inhibitor, and targeting apoptosis with venetoclax. And of course, we cannot talk about uh, uh, future directions without immunotherapy and thinking about PD-1 inhibitors uh, as well as bispecific T cell engaging antibody uh, and of course, uh, anti-CD19 CAR T cell. So I think the future is very bright with a very rich pipeline targeting uh, follicular lymphoma on multiple horizons. 
So I'll conclude by saying that novel agents are playing an increasingly dominant role in the management of our relapse refractory patients with follicular lymphoma, that our lenalidomide may supplant chemoimmunotherapy as frontline therapy, but not yet. We await that frontline phase three data, um, which is awaiting analysis. And of course, numerous promising novel agents I've just showed you targeting either the cell surface, intracellular signaling and apoptosis, uh, or the immune microenvironment are rapidly evolving and showing encouraging activity and promise to continue to move the field forward in the coming years. With that, I'll thank you very much for your attention.